Hi, I'm Eric Holmbo. I'm the Chief Medical Officer from the American Board of Internal Medicine. And I'm here today to tell you about a thrilling adventure story known as competency-based medical education. Okay, maybe it's not all that thrilling, but it's really important. And I'm hoping that through our talk today, you'll have a better understanding of what competency-based medical education is and how it can actually help you in your own training program. So here's the outline for my talk today. First, I'll start with some definitions in the history of competency-based medical education. It actually is not a new concept that's been around for a while. I'll talk about the importance of frameworks that enable a shared language and understanding, which is critical to the success of a competency-based medical education approach. And then I'll talk a little bit about the important role of milestones and entrustable professional activities, or EPAs, that is going to enable the evolution to a more effective CBME educational system. And then finally, I'll talk a little bit about assessment and how important that is in a competency-based system. So one of the things I would just ask you to reflect on for a moment is, what does competency-based medical education mean to you? It's been around for a while. We've been struggling with it now for over 10 years with the ACGME Outcomes Project. And I think a lot of us are still having a hard time kind of getting our heads around this concept. And so just reflect for a moment about how you've approached this particular meaning over the last couple of years. Well, as I mentioned earlier, this is not actually not a new concept. Believe it or not, its origins began around the time of Abraham Flexner, who wrote the seminal Carnegie Report on medical education in 1910. At that time, industry and businesses were beginning to look for a workforce that had specific skills. No longer could they just rely on unskilled labor, but needed people with specific skills to build some of the more technologically advanced uh, items such as airplanes, refrigerators, cars, and the like. The modern impetus for competency-based education actually began with reform of teacher education in the United States in the 1960s. In the 1970s, vocational education, particularly things like teaching people to be mechanics or, or doing repairs, working with heating, ventilation, and air conditioning systems and the like, found that competencies were a really good way to structure their curriculum. And in fact, today, particularly in countries like Australia, competency-based education is really the framework on which vocational education is designed. So interestingly, is, is sometimes the case, medicine's been somewhat late to this concept. Where did the kind of first principles of CBME or competency-based medical education actually come from. It's interesting to note that there's a report from the World Health Organization as far back as 1978 by Bill McGahey, George Miller, and others who wrote in their kind of seminal report this following line. The intended output of a competency-based program is a health professional who can practice medicine at a defined level of proficiency in accord with local conditions to meet local needs. So this is really the first reference to not only outcomes from a competency-based system, but also a program that's designed to meet local needs. And that's a very important concept, one that medicine has not always been terribly attentive to. Well, what about 19, you know, since then? What about competency-based medical education circa 2010? Well, a group of international educators got together several years ago to try to refine the definition for the 21st century, if you will. And here they came up with the following definition. They stated that competency-based medical education, or CBME, is an outcomes-based approach to the design, implementation, assessment, and evaluation of a medical education program using an organizing framework of competencies. The unit of progression is mastery of specific knowledge and skills. So this is a fundamental shift from what we've been doing in the past. But it raises an important question. So what are the educational outcomes and who determines them? Is it the profession? The public? Is it policymakers? What are your beliefs here? I would argue that it's all three that the outcomes are defined by all these groups. And that, again, is a pretty big shift for us within the medical education profession. This diagram, I think, really highlights, I think beautifully, why this is such a fundamental shift for us. You'll notice that 
CBME or competency based modification start with system needs. If you look at the top of the diagram, in our traditional model, the curriculum is where we always kind of started. The curriculum was defined usually through expert consensus and opinion. And once the curriculum had been developed, that led to the creation of educational objectives that were tied to some form of assessment. And this has been the model we've been using for a number of years. But as Frank and colleagues highlighted in their wonderful 2010 Lancet article, what has changed now is that you start with the needs of the population, their health needs and the needs of the health system. Then, knowing what those needs are for both the population and the system, you design the competencies and outcomes of interest. And then and only then do you develop a curriculum and the assessment methods to determine whether or not those competencies and outcomes have been reached. So you can see that we've basically flipped the traditional model on its head. We now start with the needs of the population, much like what Bill McGahey and George Miller said in their World Organization, World Health Organization report over 30 years ago. And now you only develop curriculum to really meet those needs. So our traditional approach has also been very time-based, with its emphasis on dwell time to ensure maturation occurs within the training program. As Brian Hodges points out, it's kind of like the tea steeping model of competence. We take a nice hot cup of water, we stick a tea bag in it, we leave that tea bag in there for a certain period of time, and we pull the tea bag out, pull it out at just the right time, and voila, you've got a wonderful cup of tea. But we know that dwell time is not enough. We've also, as I said, been very process-based. We have external months of training or specific types of activities over a defined period of time, and if everybody completes all those curricular activities in a set number of months of training, they're ready to go. And finally, this model's been very teacher-centered. As I pointed out on the Frank diagram, it's pretty much what the teacher determines to be important, not necessarily what the population may need. So what are the implications of competency-based medical education? Well, first, as I said, the curriculum is designed around competencies in health system and population needs. Second, trainees may advance at different rates based on their ability. Some will be able to advance more quickly, while others to a point more slowly. Now, I'd be the first to admit that our current financing model really makes us very, very difficult. And we're probably a long way from having a purely variable time-based system. But it is something to at least raise that if you've got a trainee who's particularly talented, you may want to think about what type of activities you want them to pursue, particularly in their last years of training, to make sure that they're still progressing at the best rate they possibly can. What else does this require? Well, it requires a, a definition of milestones of competency. In other words, what are, are those developmental progressional milestones or benchmarks look like? And what does competency look like at each stage along training? And in order to know if that's actually occurred, you need robust assessment methods, tools, and systems in order to do that.